You're listening to BBC Radio 4, where now states of terror and real estate from beyond the grave, as Matthew Sweet invites you inside the houses of horror. Welcome. Really, I mean it. Sit down. No, not there. The other one sat there and, well, we don't want to talk about that, do we? You'll need to sit because I have a full portmanteau of stories for you. And I know you'll appreciate all the grisly details. Stories about two houses. Two houses that dripped blood. Two houses of horror. Which one takes your fancy? Listen. I'll help you decide. Flashback. It's bedtime and I'm about 13 years old. Maybe you were too, once. And maybe you did what I did. Stayed up secretly till the small hours, watching late-night horror films. Films that came from one of two British studios. Hammer, where vampires and vampire hunters pursued each other in an endless Transylvanian day for night. And the work of another, less celebrated outfit. A studio that seemed more preoccupied with the horrors of the present day, and which sometimes gave you four or five stories for the price of one. Stories from Amicus Productions. It was delicious to know the formula. That was what I always enjoyed about the Amicus films. A wraparound story and four or five great little tales, all quite bloody. Rhys Shearsmith is an actor and writer and one quarter of the League of Gentlemen. What sort of world did these stories take place in? Because we're somewhere very different from the world of, of Hammer Horror, aren't we? Where things are much more romantic, that 19th century idea of the Gothic. I think an Amicus film is more real because suddenly it was things you hadn't seen. It was council estates and it was people's houses and it was on buses and it felt like really close to home. Sausages again. You gave me a bit more money, you might get something better. Oh, the kind of grisly 70s the Britishness of them. Well, have you any complaints then? Who do you think you're talking to in that tone of voice? Some of the girls at your office. Get on with your dinner. Well, I wonder whether if Hammer in the early 60s and late 50s was giving us the kind of the romance of the coming permissive society. Yes, yeah. Amicus tells you what happens when you wake up in the morning with a, <laughs> yes. with a, with a hangover and... Uh... Yeah, it is. It's the uh, one where, when the smoke and the, the heaving bosoms and the, and the mist clear from the Hammer film, you get what the stark reality and the, the grubbiness of the light on and an Amicus film <laughs> and the pants on the floor and... It is a little bit of a, like a wake-up call to a version of horror that's kind of more unpalatable because it's more near the truth. <laughs> it's going to be very kind of raw about it all. In the 1960s, Hammer was screaming all the way to the bank. It had discovered a formula more potent than anything Dr Jekyll ever drank from a bubbling test tube. Terror and titillation got up in Victorian fancy dress. The firm was successful, it was secretive, and maybe a little complacent. David Pirry is a horror historian. Hammer were in a kind of second wave by the mid-60s. They had capitalised on their original hits and were making sequels, and they were immensely successful. Dracula, Prince of Darkness, for example, a phenomenally successful film, almost more successful than the first Dracula. More than that, they'd been able to get round the problems they had with the censor in 1960. They'd had a real run-in with the censor at that point. Curse of the Werewolf was cut to ribbons, and they'd managed to sort of come out of that. Hammer had no reservations, especially James Carreras, the head of Hammer, who was a preeminent salesman, loved combining sex and horror. They publicised their wares, certainly, but the actual business business was kept very much to themselves. It was run in a guarded, secretive, protective fashion. They were immensely security conscious. I made a couple for Hammer, and there was a definite feeling that you weren't allowed to release the script. You definitely learn, swallow and destroy. 
Stephanie Beecham starred in both Hammer and Amicus pictures. They were proud of being Hammer, and I respect that. But it would be complete hypocrisy for me to sit here and with any seriousness talk about those films as if it was more than bullshit, bullshit, my bit. Oh, yes, I know what I've got to do tomorrow. Oh, that's right. He's going to appear at the window and I'm going to be terribly worried and scream a lot. Shall I wear the white dress? Was there something a little factory-like about Hammer? Well, yeah, you've got your props from last time, haven't you, John? Uh, well, we've got, the, uh, we've got the grave and... Uh, well, it's a cross, isn't it? No, 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 that's, no, that's not the cross. No, they don't want that because this is a modern thing. They want, uh, they want the big cross. Well, I think, well, you use a couple of those planks over there, a couple of... You know, it's a bit more that. <laughs> Rishi Smith. Hammer appeals to the more kind of literary depiction of a gothic kind of romantic horror which is fine, but there's always an element of it being a bit cutesy for me. And I, as a kid, I used to find the love interest or the strange lesbian bits strangely off-putting. So I thought, this is not the whole, what's this? This is the woman walking around in a, a nighty. What is it, my darling? And I don't know what it says about me, but I wasn't bothered. I just thought I wanted the bitings and the, and the piercings of uh, through the chest and blood and um, people Dragging. perishing. I feel the life running out of me. As though my blood were being drawn. Hammer films are full of um, tropes that you expect to see. I think, you know, bats flying, obviously, swirling mist, day for night shots, which are in all of them, which is great. Somebody with bad teeth saying, I bid you go no further. <laughs> yes. I don't care how much money you give me. I ain't going to go no further. Oh, come on, man. It'll be dark soon. Aye, it will. That's why I'll go no further. Many variants on people arriving in a, an inn and everyone else stopping dead in their tracks at the very thought that they're there. Well, what are you all looking at? It's the comfort of seeing the same walls again, slightly readjusted. Not everybody was comfortable with comfortable horror. There were some who thought that this kind of filmmaking could do with a transfusion of new blood. So, let me introduce you to the hero of our first little story. His name is Milton, a name you'd associate with evil. Milton Sabotsky. Milton thought it would be heaven to work for Hammer, but Hammer wouldn't let him through the gate. The extraordinary thing was that Sabotsky had, in a sense, been responsible for Hammer, and that must have truly irked him because he had suggested originally that Frankenstein should be adapted by a British company in Britain. A remake of the old Universal Frankenstein, very different as it turned out from what Hammer did, but nonetheless it was his idea, and a script was written and taken to Hammer. Unfortunately for Sabotsky, this was not the kind of thing that Hammer wanted to do. So they paid him off, and not only that, they didn't acknowledge him. So it clearly rankled with Sabotsky, and it probably meant that the competition was more on his side than on theirs. So, here's our primal scene. Milton Sabotsky denied entry to the Hammer House of Horror, and deciding to build his own. One that would reject Hammer's fixation with garlic and bosoms, and recreating Middle Europe on a backlot near Slough. One that would offer a new, contemporary kind of terror. One more cognizant of the workings of the human mind. One that packed five new stories instead of one long one that you felt you'd probably seen somewhere before. Packed them into the portmanteau horror film. A form that became an amicus trademark. First out of the bag was Dr. Terror's House of Horrors in 1965. Amicus poached Freddie Francis from Hammer to direct it. Milton Sabotsky himself wrote the script, or scripts. A tale of voodoo. A tale of werewolves. A tale of a killer vine starring Alan Fluff Freeman. A plant like that could take over the world. One about a vampire. The only way to kill a vampire is to drive a wooden stake. One about a heart. disembodied hand. <laughs> All tales told by a tarot card reader played by Peter Cushing, D. 
detailing the destinies of five men in a railway carriage who have already been claimed by death. The tarot deck is a picture book of life. I call it my house of horrors. More films followed. Torture Garden in 1967. The House That Dripped Blood Three Years Later, a compendium of stories by Robert Block linked by a series of monstrous events in a monstrous detached property in the home counties. It's that house. There's something about it. What? I don't know, sir. I see. Tales from the Crypt, an asylum, followed in 1972. There certainly was a competition between Hammer and Amicus. I mean, there were different basic points of view and attitudes towards the medium. Hammer would hammer one horror theme right through a movie, whereas Amicus preferred the sort of portmanteau concept. Peter Duffel directed The House That Dripped Blood for Amicus in 1970. You're going to tell a story very economically because you're doing it in this portmanteau version so that you know, have a number of stories in one film so they've got to be concise and precise and economical in length and yet work. The game to play of course if you like these films is to cherry pick all the best ones and, and put the best portmanteau horror film collect the five best stories from across the board and make one great film out of them. Are there any that are absurd and don't work at all? Well, they're all successful. Torture Garden has got some bad stories in it. It's one about a man-eating grand piano. <laughs> no! 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 <laughs> Which is uh, really kind of not very good. In a house in South London are all the books from which Milton Sabotsky chose his tales for Amicus. They're at the home of his widow, Fiona, a professional psychiatrist. Perhaps I imagined it, but when I went to see her, the titles on the spine seem to follow us around the room. The living room. It's a bit of a dark room. Books all over and actually three deep. And this is the ghost story section. They're the tales that he was so fond of. In fact, he had so many and I was always reading them for him too. Looking for material for, looking for portmanteau material. pictures. Looking for material for portmanteau pictures. And then I sort of swore never to read another short story in my life again. The titles are jumping out at me from the shelf here. Living in Fear, Dying of Fright, Madame Fears the Dark. That's beautiful, isn't it? Isn't it? A, a black and silver cover with a skull forming in a cloud by Margaret Irwin, 1935. That's the sort of thing. So he had a strong sense then of the archaeology of this kind of fiction? I think he liked the ones with surprise and a sense of humour, simple tales with a framework, simple and moral tales. That was quite important for him. Why was that so important? Because the morality of them is very profound, isn't it? These are warnings. <laughs> yes. There's no sort of, I don't say there aren't innocent victims, but they're not the point. It's not the exploitation of the innocent victims. It's the evil humans that really get it. Milton Sabotsky's business partner was Max J. Rosenberg, a tough-talking New York socialist who went into pictures after spending the 1930s failing to radicalise Irish labourers employed on New Deal construction projects. The name Amicus, yes. I think, refers to the friendship between Milton and Max Rosenberg. What kind of relationship was that? They occupied very different spaces. And I used to see Max occasionally when he blew in, as it were. And he used to be often getting the deals together, doing the glad handing. Whereas Milton was more down on the studio floor in the cutting room. And certainly this particular format, and he would say this quite often aloud, the big stars who might have been either busy with other films or indeed playing in the West End to come down and be a big name and go off again. Ah yes, the casts, more genuinely distinguished than the ones that Hammer could muster. Terry Thomas, Ralph Richardson, Patrick McGee, Sylvia Sims, Richard Todd, people who you'd have thought wouldn't be seen dead in a horror picture. I never thought of or had ever been involved with the horror genre, but if Sir Ralph Richardson does a horror, in inverted commas, then you can. David Warner starred in From Beyond the Grave. 
a portmanteau directed by Kevin Connor for Amicus in 1974 and adapted from the ghost stories of Ronald Chetwind Hayes. It's horribly, horribly good, a man-trap of a film, and David's character is the first to step into it. So your character walks in off the street into this little alleyway. Well, he is looking for second-hand goods. Peter Cushing is the proprietor of the antique shop. The bell rings. And there is Peter Cushing. Good morning, sir. Can I help you at all? And some strange stuff in there. There's taxidermy. There's sinister puppets looking at you from the nooks and crannies. But my eye falls on just one thing. I was just looking at this mirror. Oh, it's a lovely piece. A mirror. Quite lovely. How much are you asking for it? David's character soon discovers that he's won the prize in the devil's own bargain hunt. There's a face in this mirror. The face of a man who compels the mirror's owner to kill and kill again in order to release him from his prison on the other side of the glass. You must feed me. I do remember there was a seance scene. Get the stuff off the table and pull it into the middle of the room. It's seance time. And one of the things I remember saying, not that I'm particularly superstitious or anything, I said, let us not, when we're around this table, actually really touch our fingers, all of us together. Fingers touching. For some reason, I just didn't want to do that. Concentrate. I suppose if the forces of darkness were going to materialise anywhere, they would have done it on the set of a 1970s horror picture. Yes, I suppose so. Well, I made good care that that didn't happen. <laughs> the second story in the sequence is the creepiest of the lot. The story of the grim little marriage of Ian Bannon and Diana Dawes. Well, well, they won't be spoken to in this way. Don't you get violent with me. And a strange father and daughter who offer a troubled husband a little respite from his misery. My name is Underwood. Jim Underwood. This is my daughter, Emily. Don't she make a smashing cake, sir? Oh, yes, indeed, yes. A real father and daughter played those parts. Donald Pleasance and Angela Pleasance, who are unforgettably peculiar. What do you remember about acting opposite your father. There's a sense that there's a conspiracy between the pair of you. Scared. I was, <laughs> I was so terrified he was going to turn around and say, what do you think you're doing? <laughs> crap, crap, crap. But what I lacked in technique, I obviously seemed to somehow portray within my imagination. It just came out of me, somewhere deep down in the recesses of my mind. In the film, there's a section where I was asked to hum singing, moving around the room. And I'm not even sure if I invented the words myself. In the cold wettest, we come she sings a little song about death and decay. There's just something really creepy about the language she uses. She's so not of the same plane. And we keeps it to ourselves. That's a funny song. And Banner's like, it's a funny little song, is singing. Singing, was Singing, I? was I? Yes. Just making up words. Just making up words. It's so creepy and horrible. And what's brilliant about it is it's so British. It's just really gritty and, and real. That's what's funny about it, however odd and ethereal it all might be. This is a story about houses of horror, so we need to do a little survey. The houses in Hammer Pictures were usually the same one, Oakley Court, a gargoyled Victorian pile that the studio cheerfully dressed and redressed as the Tsar's Winter Palace, a Transylvanian monastery, Castle Dracula, Castle Frankenstein and a mansion in Cornwall. The houses in Amicus were recognisable domestic spaces, rented cottages, flats in big conversions, modernist apartments, places that people might actually live. Amicus stayed out of the Carpathians and the 19th century, the very place that Hammer felt most at home. But occasionally, inevitably, they strayed into each other's space. 
and the results were horrible. Dracula, AD 1972. The date Hammer put in its diary to bring Christopher Lee's cloaked count out of the Victorian past and into the world in which Amicus was already settled. The year is 1972, a leap year in horror. Don Horton wrote the film Alan Gibson directed, dragging the eye of the camera across high-rise brutalist car parks and filling the script with hipster slang. Let's get this straight. You're talking about black mass and that sort of jazz, right? Yes, that sort of jazz. Hey, but it sounds wild. Stephanie Beecham starred as Jessica Van Helsing, great-great-granddaughter of Peter Cushing's original vampire slayer. The poster explained what they were after. The Count is back with an eye for London's hot pants and a taste for everything. When you got the call for Dracula, AD 1972, what sort of attitude did you take it in? Took it as a joke. But you know, Daddy Cushing and Christopher Lee take it seriously. I mean, Christopher definitely thought that putting in a pair of teeth was very difficult acting. That having been said, Peter Cushing and I did some scenes that I would say, no, that's as good acting as you'll get out of me any old time. I mean, I loved that man, that actor. I mean, though I loved the man. Jessica. Oh, grandfather, look, I've never dropped acid. I'm not shooting up, and I'm not sleeping with anybody just yet. For those people who haven't seen the picture, no, could you... There's nobody, there's nobody that hasn't seen the picture. Surely it's, it's, it's one of the most famous pictures ever. Could um, you sketch in the premise for no, us? not really. OK, I'll do it then. It's about a gang of Dracula's disciples who infiltrate the Chelsea set, perform black masses in a ruined church, raise the count, and prepare Stephanie for sacrifice. <laughs> In my dreams, I go back to the year 1795. Amicus trod gently into Hammer's territory with its only way. gothic feature film, and now the screaming starts. I was going to the house in which I was to find my days filled with fear. A faintly sleazy horror by Roy Ward Baker, set in the 1790s and starring Stephanie again as a newlywed in the Age of the Enlightenment with slightly anachronistic hair and makeup and pursued by a disembodied hand. What is it, child? Oh. We had a terrible hand. We had a terrible hand following us up the stairs. Oh, my God. Poor Ian Ogilvy had to carry me in a very heavy wedding dress up the stairs 17 times. This, excuse me, hand couldn't climb up the stairs very well. Are you meant to take that seriously? And now The Screaming Starts is a pretty lurid title, but it's rather accurate, isn't it? The screaming doesn't really stop in that picture. <laughs> I think I had my teeth, I think it was after the hammer that I had my fillings made white because I realized that screaming was going to be really showing all the fillings in your mouth. Later I started playing bitches, so you didn't have to worry about your feelings anymore. And also stop playing victims. You see, those women were victims. What do you make of that side of the horror genre through those two films? I was well aware that these were retro at the time. By the mid-1970s, both houses of horror were beginning to crumble. Hammer had discovered that On the Buses was a hotter property than Bram Stoker, and that Kung Fu vampire pictures were not as profitable as they'd hoped. Amicus had abandoned horror for adventure films aimed at boys, magically odd pictures like The Land That Time Forgot, about a Nazi U-boat stranded on a dinosaur-filled island off the coast of Antarctica. Horror had moved on in a direction that these British studios couldn't quite follow. Film historian David Peary. Following the boom years of the mid-60s and the early 70s, Hammer and Amicus sort of went down at the same time. The demand petered out. There was no way that either of them were able to start up new franchises. They weren't able to capitalise on the kind of success that was coming out of America with films like Night of the Living Dead. And they ran out of inspiration and material, and they ran out of luck. And it wasn't just budgets. 
Also, the themes have been taken up by the major studios in America and were being given high gloss treatment and more violent, darker themes than Hammer or Amicus had ever addressed. Films like The Exorcist and The Omen, they'd never really got near. There was a level of intensity of horror here, which neither studio had ever quite managed. And I think that was the final nail in their coffin. But new horror didn't destroy the old. Hammer went into television and recently enjoyed a triumphant resurrection on the big screen. Amicus had an afterlife too, on the outer limits of the TV schedules, and a whole generation grew up watching its quartets and quintets of terror on the upstairs portable long after bedtime. And it didn't do us any harm. Not much. Not really. For some, they proved an inspiration. Reese Shearsmith. I'm glad that people have cherished them the way they have and it hasn't gone away. I wish there were more of them. What kind of mark do these films make on your work? Well, I mean, if we have one thing in common with myself and Mark Gatiss and Jeremy Dyson and Steve Pemerson, we all have a collective memory of these films, and particularly Amicus, because they generally all are Amicus films, all these portmanteaus, and they collectively, completely across the board, peppered our childhoods. And when we think of the dark and the comedic, a lot of that is in these films, but done really well. When it's done the best, it's when the horror is fully done straight, and then when the comedy is there, and it's also there, and it's, but it's also done for comic effect. We've never tried to parody any of these films. It's always been meant. There's no way out there. So, we're almost done. Not too gruesome, was it? Now, the Amicus portmanteau film usually ended when the narrator, an antique shop proprietor or a tarot card reader or even an estate agent, would break the fourth wall and address the audience directly. Perhaps you understand the secret of this house now. I'm not saying that's happening here. I hope it finds a proper tenant soon. That would be presumptuous. Perhaps you would like it. There's nothing to be afraid of. Think it over. But I did tell you that I'd be asking you to make a choice. Which house of horror do you think that you'd be happiest in? Hammer or Amicus? The exotic or the uncanny? The Victorian past or the seedy, creepy environment of the present day? The Gothic castle or a sinister version of your own home? Ah, I see you've made your choice. I think we're going to be very happy here. Don't you? Houses of Horror was presented by Matthew Sweet and produced by Simon Hollis. It was a Brooke Lapping production for 